Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have a hero conversation. I'm very excited to have with me Mr. Jim Wirtz, who is the president and senior electrical engineer at Alta Vista Instruments and Controls. So welcome, Jim. Good to be here, Chris. I'm excited to have you, man. It's very excited to have you. Alta Vista, that's a beautiful part of the part of Virginia up there that you're in. Yes, and today the weather's nice and uh, definitely enjoying the sun and and a little bit of warm weather. It's been rough here in the last few weeks, but it has. It's been a tough winter, man. I, I, that groundhog. I guess he did see that shadow <laughs> after all, man. <laughs> it was. It's been a tough one for sure. You bet. So, man, we we love these conversations, Jim, and and just to get to know about you and and what you're doing there at AIC. So maybe you can just start off by telling us a little bit about your journey. Sure thing. I um, I, I certainly have to say I, I appreciate you having me on too. Um, flattered that you take some interest. One of the things that comes to mind, I kind of go back to my childhood a little bit. Uh, I was, uh, as a kid growing up, I loved to take things apart. I don't think my parents thought a lot of it, but <laughs> I, uh, I really did have an inquiring mind. So I, I, I went to town. I, I took more things apart and <laughs> it broke more things than I probably care to even share. But you know, one of the things that, that drove my uh, desire was a little bit out of guilt. After I got those things apart, they didn't work anymore. Right. <laughs> I figured out how they worked, but uh, then I started putting them back together, you know, and, and that was a little bit more of a challenge than taking them apart. But that, you know, just that nature, the inquisitive nature, I think, drove uh, me to where, I, where I've gone. You know, I'm always strong in math. In uh, school, I spent uh, a few extra semesters at, in college focusing on math and in uh, in the sciences. Yeah. But I came out of there and I started my career. Um, well, I say came out of there. I started my career really in school. I was in college, went to Virginia Tech. Go Hokies. Go Hokies. And, uh, okay. Yeah, that's right. And um, yeah. while I was up there, I, I was working at a, a PC I don't want to call it a repair shop. They sold computers. And during the course of that, uh, I learned a lot because the the customers come in, you know, and they had problems. And I was always the guy that wanted to tackle that. I wanted to see if I could fix what was going on with their computer. You know, I, that was um, just part of my nature. So that really drove a little bit of my career there because I had, I had a lot of opportunities. Um, I kind of grew up around power and, and things. My dad was, uh, he worked for AEP and this is a long time ago when things were a little looser safety wise, but I'd go to work with him. You know, I grew up in a hydro plant, you know, you could go in and, and stand right alongside the state, the, uh, the rotors and these generators, yeah. you know, while they're spinning. And, you know, that, that place was always amazing. Um, yeah, my, my dad always told me too, he says, Anything that looks like it conducts electricity, son, he said, stay at least five foot away from it. And if you're not sure, stay 10. So, <laughs> you know, it was, but growing up in that environment, my dad, he, um, he was a fix it type of guy. You know, he was a troubleshooter. Uh, and I followed right in, right along those uh, footsteps. But so getting through college, uh, doing a little work there, my, my background, my interest was electrical. I think that that was always a thing. I started my first real career with international paper. Uh, started out as a project engineer for them. And I remember uh, one of the first jobs I got, I mean, you knew I had an electrical background, so they really threw it to me, you know. <laughs> there were yeah. some challenges in there. Coordinated drive systems and um, it's a trial by fire type thing, but they had a program called the TMD program. It was a technical management development okay. uh, program. And what that did was it was a rotation based thing. Um, I think IP uh, recognized their leadership and a lot of the management retiring all at about the same time. So they were doing this rapid development program to bring, bring uh, some of us along pretty quickly. So I entered into that. I uh, did some rotations there. 
uh, worked out in California some, I worked in Mississippi some, and, you know, really project-based engineering with an electrical um, specialization. Okay. So I, I spent quite a bit of time there. I, I um, worked my way up through, I uh, did process engineering for a while, and then I was uh, electrical engineer and, and later became an electrical ma manager for the facility in Danville, Virginia. I uh, spent a little time there, uh, got into some corporate special projects, and then that kind of took off. I, you know, I was traveling and going places and, and uh, pretty, pretty interesting projects, a lot of fun. But ultimately, I think the, the real thing was I needed to move. And at one, one point in time, I can remember my, my wife being at home and, and I had my first child and she was sick and I was on a plane headed to Chicago, you know, and, and I'm going, man, this is not good. I, I, I'd rather be back home. And I, I ended up leaving IP for travel reasons. They wanted me to relocate to Chicago too. And it just wasn't in the cards for me then. So I, I left there and uh, went to work um, at R.R. Donnelly over in Lynchburg. I followed a, uh, a close friend of mine. He was there and he said, man, it's a great place to work. And I started a career there. I was a plant electrical engineer. And again, uh, working on projects. Next thing you know, we were doing uh, division or, or platform projects and I was traveling again. And so, oh man. <laughs> so there, there's this travel thing that I was, um, I enjoyed. Yeah. But I uh, really wanted to, settle in at home uh, I was a little bit of a homebody right but I did I ended up um, doing a lot of moonlighting along the years uh, when I cleared it with my managers but I did a lot of PLC programming on the side and that began to grow and and uh, take some shape and suddenly I was making more doing that than I was at my regular job and I thought man I just need to, and I loved it I mean I just I love to program and create and uh, solve problems so that drew me closer and closer, and I ended up leaving R.R. Uh, Donnelly and going to work for an integrator. And I, I did that for a while. I've been in that integrator circle for, um, gosh, it's been more than 10 years for sure in that circle. And it, as that uh, progressed, I uh, met some other folks and uh, went, went to work for AIC, and eventually, um, completed a, a secession plan there and and uh, went into partnership with an, another fellow, Jordan Manny, and bought AIC out. And uh, and here I am today. And, and we're just rolling with the punches and, and having a lot of fun doing it and, and getting a lot of stuff done. Very, yeah. very active project, um, project list going on now. Well, maybe that's great. Can maybe could you share a little bit about AIC and what you the type of things that you guys get involved with there? Sure. Um, you know, our our customer base is fairly local. I've been uh, been to Arizona, been to Ohio, some a couple places out away from the area, but for the most part, our customer base is within a couple of hundred miles. So we stay fairly, you know, fairly close. The fun projects, one of the projects I did uh, in Lynchburg for, and this is for Gerdau, we put a uh, 5,000 horsepower drive in. And we had like nine days to do this. It involved removing a building, uh, removing a, a locomotive engine that was set up as an MG set, and bringing in a um, Rockwell engineered drive and transformer system and, and installing that. We had this really tight window and it was a lot of work and prep work, you know, that went into that to make that happen. And, and we pulled it off and man, what a cool project to see, you know, that size equipment uh, operating and, and, and how well the, all the teams played together. But I, you know, that was, that's kind of us. And that's our core is, is we're the glue that puts all that together. You know, we, we work, uh, a lot of times as a customer's representative, you know, we're sitting in there, we know the technical stuff, or at least we're much more familiar with it than the customer is sometimes, you know, their, their project managers might not have 
a power background or a PLC background, but we may have the capability to to sit in there and and um, interpret a lot of that for them and help them make decisions. So that you know, thinking about that project and, and where we sat in that position, we did do PLC programming. We integrated some of the auxiliary equipment in, um, but we hired out and um, managed. Uh, some technicians in there. So we've got some subcontractors in there working for us. And we've got, you know, we're working alongside Rockwell and their drives group, you know, that big drive. And, you know, so that, that, um, I think we play, you know, played a key role in, in that project. And even in the design stage of that, you know, we had a lot of the concept and the ideas behind how to go from uh, where they were and how they were operating to that new setup with that new drive. So that, you know, we we sat in a lot of positions there, if you will, in that project. But but that's kind of AIC. We we look at the problem and we figure out how to tackle it. We figure out how to get the resources together and make it all happen. Yeah. I mean it sounds like you have a great team there too. So that that oh, yeah. was that was that the one in Lynchburg you said on that project? it is. It is. Okay. Yep. Very good. Cool. Yeah, very, very cool. fun. Your exciting project. Yep. I haven't been to that particular Gerdau. I've been to the one in Petersburg. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the uh, I believe it's a roll mill there in Petersburg, but I haven't been to the one in Lynchburg. So what, what do they do at that one? At that site, they're not a. It's not a steel mill. They're a scrapyard. They have a shredder. And in fact, that five thousand horsepower drive. That's what. Uh, that's what we were. We were putting together. That project had a. Uh, a locomotive and it's pretty interesting how I how that came to be I got a phone call um, on a Friday afternoon at five o'clock from a guy that was desperate he had called everybody he knew and and he had people come out and look at it and and just walk away he said, no, you know nothing we can do he says I'm down I need some help and I heard you might can help me and I said well I don't know certainly willing to come over and look at it. You know, I, I called my wife and said, look, I'm going to be late. <laughs> anyway, I, I traveled to the site. I took a look at what they had and they had a system that was engineered from the ground up. It had a, a, um, a custom built excitation controller and they had a, a GE locomotive or it's actually EMD, but it was a locomotive sitting there with a generator on the end that generator. Uh, had connection to traction motors, to D32, these big, uh, I think about 2,000 horsepower DC motors that were coupled into this shredder to run to turn the the shredder itself. And that controller um, had caught on fire, and it was a one-off. You know, it was custom made, and they had had it repaired before. And the person that had built it was no longer there. I'm not sure what you know, happened there. If, if they were even around, it looked like it'd been there for a while. So I look at it and I go, wow, what am I getting into here? <laughs> but I said, you know, I'm willing to help you. I don't know whether I can fix it or not, but I need, you know, I'll take a look at it. That's, I can promise you that I'll look at it and, and, and we'll try. So I, I took all the wires loose on this, this excitation controller and, and just started tracing this, trying to reverse engineer this thing. They've, They've had all these companies, electronics companies. They've had engineers come in there and, you know, and, and I took it home and I started to disassemble this and some of the components I couldn't identify. So I drew that my, my background's in analog design. So it probably pretty fitting for me to look at it. And I, I kind of drew the circuits out and understood, figured out what was really going on in this thing. And I didn't know some of the voltages and some of the components in there, but I, I took a stab at it course you know you can't just go buy resistors and transistors anymore like you, you used to could but I just happen to have a few things in the basement so uh, I actually disassembled a few things to get some components I repaired it and they were in a bad spot you know I know they were losing money I know it was a bad situation for them and I, I came in it was Sunday morning when I, I worked around the clock on it and I got it repaired I tested it with a rig that I set up and I felt like it was going to work. Got there and I told him, I said, no promises, you know, but we're going to try this. And sure as a world, we fired it up and it worked. And uh, they were able to get back into production that Monday morning. And it, it 
it's born a, a great relationship after that. But that locomotive, um, you know, it served its purpose and, and it needed to come out. And I knew quite a bit about it after the years of service and it after that time. But uh, it was uh, good. They actually got onto the grid finally. They were, they were always off grid with that power plant. But uh, they went on to the grid later with that 5,000 horsepower drive system. Just how it all came about, just being at the right place at the right time, and the willingness to jump in and help. I, you know, it was um, a little bit overwhelming at first, but I have a knack of getting into those things, and, and <laughs> I like a challenge. <laughs> Well, that's a great story, man. I mean, yeah. what, what way to take it all the way from, from that phone call on Friday to around the clock and you had the resources, but you also had the talent, the type of partnership you were able to form with that, man. That, that's wonderful. And to thank you so much for sharing about that and for what you guys are doing at AIC. I mean, it, it sounds like you got a lot of fun things going and you're out there supporting industry on a regular basis. You know, what are you seeing are some of the greatest challenges of the industries that you serve in particular? You know, greatest challenges, I think probably the biggest thing I see right now is security. Okay. I mean, as odd as it sounds, I think um, what we see the most, the most motion on right now is uh, the challenge and the fear that a lot of these companies have about intrusion and, you know, we've seen some of these things and, you know, I've, I've been to a lot of the, the Rockwell sessions where we talked about that and, you know, it is a real concern. And as companies are beginning to understand what they need to do to secure their systems and, and their networks and their equipment, it's a real challenge for us in this space because quite often we'll, we'll have a, a machine that doesn't work, you know, and we're out there supporting that machine and, and we're there to help them, but the keys are locked up in somebody else's possession and, and it's really difficult sometimes to get into that. So that's, that's one of our challenges is being able to have the openness enough for the support but enough protection in place that it's not an open door for someone to come in and do some damage or, or you know, destroy some equipment or, or create some production loss. So, yeah, that I, I think that's our biggest challenge right now. I used to think it was um, satisfying the safety world. I, I think uh, now it's security. I think that's the, the big push and, and the big change that we're working through. Yeah, it's a fine line when you get to talking about remote connectivity and yes. access. It's you know, when you cross the IT and the OT world and, th and those things start coming together. That's I a real challenge. You know, this whole COVID thing has brought up a lot of stuff too. The, the pandemic has caused um, a big push for that remote connectivity and that remote um, working environment. So it's opened the doors for a lot of problems, uh, you know, and it also has opened up some, you know, ideas on our side. We, we started out, we put together these crash boxes because we're not allowed on, you know, we're allowed in front of the PLC and on the plant floor, but we're not allowed on the network and everything's connected now and, and, and this connectivity is great if you can use it. Right. Uh, so we're a little bit, you know, we're navigating this space. So we created these crash boxes and they are a cellular connection. It's a physical plug-in, you know, and, and, if they've got that control logics rack, it's great because we can supply them an ethernet card. If they have an empty slot, they can plug us in and I can have a team of people sitting right there to help them diagnose or, or fix something or change something, whatever they're after and not have to be right in front of that PLC. I can let their person do that. And then when we're done, that comes out and comes right back to us. So that's been a, a really interesting way to do that. So that, you know, and of course that has its own security um, thing considerations there too, but we've been able to help a lot of customers with those uh, crash boxes. And that's something new since the, the pandemic, but yeah, just, just uh, solving problems, you know, when we run into them, that's what we're, what we're good at. Now, what did you call those Jim check boxes? Crash boxes. Uh, just crash boxes. What I, you know, just named it. There's no real, no acronym or anything. Just, uh, okay. 
you know, just when they get in trouble, we send that thing out and, and we can be there in force, you know, we can have two or three connections into there and, and, uh, and help them out. So. Well, that, that crash box, that sounds like some pretty cool stuff, man. And, and, and great insight there on the challenges that you're seeing. And, you know, let's, let's pretend we're sitting in front of some high schoolers or some young, some, maybe some young college kids or at, at a vote at, at a vocational school. And we want to give them some encouragement or some advice about a, pursuing a career in industry. What are you going to tell that generation? What they need to know is it is challenging. And with that challenge, because you know, comes great reward. I'm telling you, when you solve these problems and, and you pull these people out of the bind or you design a solution that makes everybody's life better or um, supplies a product that's in need, but you can make an impact in this in this industry. There's no doubt about it. And being prepared, you know, experience is huge. Get yeah. all the experience you can. That's my thing. I, and, you know, have those interactions uh, like this right here. You know, this is, this is great. You know, learn. Don't stop learning. Dig in. Don't be afraid of anything either. I think uh, a lot of times I see people um, draw up a little bit. They're a little timid of, over a, a situation and, you know, communicate. Make sure it's clear before you dive into something that's over your head that, you know, make sure the expectations are clear, but dive in, you know, you got to jump to figure out if you can fly, right? So that's right. That's dive right. in, do it. Great stuff. Now, how about from a, from a uh, AIC, have you had an opportunity to mentor other, other people that are coming into industry or help them along their way? You know, I am so glad you asked that. Um, yes, AIC and I, I've got a, I've got, I'll call Jordan Maddie out and he's my business partner. Okay. Uh, he started here in high school. Uh, the, the, the previous owner, the founder, Bill Jackson, I can't say enough good things about Bill Jackson, but Bill took, uh, Jordan on under his wing and Jordan was PLC programming in high school, you know, and just the, the outreach and bringing, bringing in these young folks and, and teaching them and showing them what's out there, you know, what you can be doing uh, is huge. And I think long-term, you know, he's now an owner in the business. You look long-term, that's the seed that keeps this thing moving. You know, that, that crop keeps growing. You keep planting those seeds and that's what you're doing. And, and uh, you know, engaging those young minds. I had the opportunity over the last few years, my daughter, um, she's, uh, she's 17 now going on 21. Right. right. But she entered into, uh, the beta program when she was, I don't know, I don't know what grade it was. She was probably in, uh, fifth grade or so. And in the beta program was a leadership program. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but they, they're developing leaders. You know, that that's the program and you have to have, um, not only do you have to have good grades to be in that program, but you have to have exceptional character. So with that program, they, um, they, they go to these state conventions and things and they have competitions and there are lots of different competitions. They have art, science type stuff. They have talent type stuff. But the first time we went, and of course me being an engineer, um, I don't think I pushed her into this. <laughs> I think it was by her choice, but she was on this thing called tower of power okay. where they, they had to, you know, they were going to get some um, components and have to build a tower as tall as they could to hold, I think it was a tennis ball for a minute. And they go into this uh, closed door environment and they have to do this and we see if we win. Right. So they hadn't practiced. Uh, they all just, they're at convention and they're deciding what they're going to do. And they put together a team. They were all sitting around. They had a, a bunch of straws. That, that was it. Straws, tape, and they had to hold the tennis ball. So they're struggling. You know, I was watching. I'm, I'm a parent, right, in the background. And I'm just biting my tongue because, I mean, I, I, was, I love statistics. I love, um, you know, deforms and all that stuff. I, was, I really like that part of engineering. And I'm watching them try to build this straw tower and I, I was just like oh man <laughs> so finally I couldn't hold back anymore and I, I went over to the uh, sponsor that was there with them and I said hey is it any way I could talk to them and she's oh yeah sure we encourage you know 
participation with the parents. So I said, okay. I said, Hey guys, come here for a minute. You know, and I, I got out the Sharpie. I mean, the, uh, dry erase and, and went over the board that was in this conference room that they were at in this hotel. And, and I started drawing, I said, look, you need to think about this. You need to think about this. You know, I said, you got to solve this. Like you're putting the ball in a cup, not the ball on top of a mountain. You don't, you, you need stability. You're not thinking stability. And, and we started talking about physics a little bit and things and, and, uh, they went off and they competed and, and they didn't win. I was like, well, they didn't place. And they came out of there. They were so pumped. They had the tallest, tower and it held the ball for the minute but okay. they didn't win they weren't sure why and we couldn't we actually didn't figure out what happened and i told them i said you probably stepped on the rules you know there were there were a whole bunch of rules they gave them i said you probably did something you weren't supposed to do and got disqualified i don't know so the next year rolls around and the next year they had another engineering portion and and i i said look i said this time around let's practice, you know, let's see if we can see how we do. And they, they had this competition in the next year with something like a Rube Goldberg type thing. You know, they were going to give them so many components, you know, so many materials that they could have, it all had to fit in a container. And then they were going to be given a prompt at the competition and they would have two hours to construct a device to do whatever this prompt was. Okay. I said, well, that sounds like fun, you know? So, I told him, I said, why don't you come down to AIC? I'll invite you down. You guys practice, you know? I said, I'll give you a prompt and you just try to do it. So they, they came down and um, they started practicing, you know, and, and tinkering around and, you know, it's just, they could have popsicle sticks and all these little, just simple stuff you might find in your home or, or a garage somewhere. And that's probably what I did. I collected as much as I could and threw it in a box. Yeah. Well, they went to state that year and they won first place. All right. And uh, first time they competed in that type of, you know, situation. And we were all, we, we had to leave, you know, we don't see what's going on. And, and uh, after it was over with, they came out excited and I said, did it work? And they said, yeah, it went on. It did everything it was supposed to do. I said, well, that's great. Well, they ended up winning, you know, and they went to nationals. And they actually at nationals and they, they were all freshmen in high school. Uh -huh. So we get to nationals and, uh, they ended up third place in nationals in Savannah, Georgia, which just blew my mind. I took it. We, we rented a house down there and took the kids down and they, they, um, that big conference center and all the, every state's involved, you know, all the high schools in, in across the U S is, is your, uh, your pool of competition, but they went down and, and placed third in nation as fre a freshman group. Well, the next year we got first place nice. state first place na nationals the next year we did a repeat Woo. so back-to-back -back national champions and uh and the kids you know just being able to to provide a little bit of mentorship for them and and to see their minds and and just that that evolution of their thought process and stuff that's pretty rewarding too i i, I really enjoyed that and i think that's a, a little bit of the nature of aic too we yeah. we do like to um promote and, and, and educate that next generation. I think that's, uh, that's exciting. That's just as exciting as, as the customer side of it. You know, what about some of those kids that are doing it? I mean, do they, do they have these preconceived notions of what you do and maybe you have to say, and no, this is not what we do. This is, this is more reality. Yeah, I, I, um, I think so. I think, well, a lot of them think we just work on computers. Um, and, and to the, you know, to their defense, it sort of is a, just a computer, you know, when you think about PLCs, but there is so much more to that in, in the automation world and, uh, being able to see some of our projects, kind of share some of that stuff with them and, and some of the things that we do on site. You know, I definitely think we spark some interest there in some of these young folks that have been, been on that, uh, engineering team. I hope so. Anyway, okay. I feel like we did, <laughs> but, uh. Now, how about you yourself, man? When are you the happiest? Because it seems like you just have a passion for helping these people and just helping your AIC be the best. Yeah, I, you know, I'm definitely the happiest when we walk away and we've pulled somebody out of a jam. That's my, that's my fuel. That relationship between the customers is, is a lot of fun. But, but when something goes wrong, even if it's in the middle of the night, I answer my phone. I give my phone, you know, a lot of people in this industry don't give their phone out like 
I do. <laughs> and I tell everybody, if I can answer the phone, I'm going to answer it. And I don't care if it's 2 o'clock in the morning. It doesn't matter. And if, if I can come out there and fix it, you bet I'll be there. Right. So that that's um, I think that's what really fuels me. And that's where I'm the happiest when I walk away. And especially when it's a tough problem and we've done something that, you know, just not everybody's going to run in there and do. I, I definitely feel good about that. It makes me happy. That's pretty cool, man. Tell you what, this has been some great stories. How about we talk a little bit outside of work for a minute? Sure thing. Yeah. I'd love love to, to share with our listeners about you, you know, from, from uh, things you do on, on your own time. So how about some hobbies? What do you enjoy doing for fun? Besides work? Um, <laughs> yeah, my, my wife probably would say something about that too. <laughs> yeah, I, I've got several hobbies. Uh, but, you know, I'd say my number one hobby is my wife and kids. I mean, I, I really do. I, I love to do stuff with the family and, and, you know, that really is my number one hobby. But outside of that, I'm a Jeep nut. I, um, okay. I love to off-road, uh, mountain trails. If I can, if I can strand myself on the top of a mountain in the middle of nowhere, that's what I want to do. <laughs> I love to love to ride the trails. I've got some close friends and, uh, and we have a couple of Jeeps in our driveway too. So usually if I need somebody to go with me, I, I'll, uh, I'll have no problem finding that. Right. I love my Jeeps. Um, I like horse, you know, we're into horses. My, uh, we've got several Tennessee walkers. Uh, we do a lot of showing uh -huh. as a family, as a group. And uh, that's, that's, that takes a lot of time. That's, that's a whole lot of fun. If you, oh, yeah. if you've ever done any horseback riding through the mountains, there's, um, there, it's hard to beat that too. That that's a lot of fun. So yeah. those are probably my two big ones. Used to do a lot of RC racing, the little RC cars, you know, Yeah, yeah. I used to race Tony Stewart before. Can you say, oh. I, I might not be able to say his name. I don't know. Is that royalties well, we'll or something? Call, we'll just call him smoke <laughs> for, for, you know. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I uh, it was pretty serious in that for a long time, but um, yeah, I had the fastest cars, no doubt. I figured out how to make the motor go fast. That's Motors awesome. and batteries, I'm the electrical guy, right? I had to figure that out, and I figured that out. Now, I couldn't drive it, right. <laughs> but I could go fast. Now, do you work on your own Jeeps and stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I, uh, I get my hands greasy, so I don't mind. That's That's part of the fun. I figured as much. I just wanted to clarify that. So that's, so that's yeah, awesome. Often... It is a lot of fun. Yeah. Now you mentioned your, your number one hobby is your wife and your, your kids. What can you, what would you like to share about? How many kids do you have? What would you like to share about your family? Well, I've got two daughters, um, a, a 10 and a 17, and they definitely keep me busy. And my wonderful wife who's, who's, uh, and I say wonderful because she's put up with me <laughs> for, for 21 years just about so nice. actually longer than that we dated for we were high school sweethearts we we dated eight years before we got married i think um i i had to wait to 2020 to get married and i say i tell everybody this too because i'm a a little bit funny about numbers and things uh, but if i got married in 2020 then i wouldn't have to remember how long i'd been married you know i could just look at the year and go i mean 2020 2000 2000 so 2020, yeah i, yeah, I don't but I, I could look at that year and I go, oh yeah, I've been married 21 years. There you go. <laughs> I wouldn't have to, I don't have to think about it. <laughs> That's awesome, man. That's but, uh, so I pushed her out for eight years to get to that point, but uh, <laughs> she put up with me. <laughs> now, are y'all's families are, are from that area? Yes, my wife's family is um, very close, uh, just a few miles away from Alta Vista. And, and likewise, I was born in Danville, grew up. Yeah. Uh, close to Danville, Virginia, and um, my my family was from that way. So, yep, yeah, we're, we're all in the area, and that's probably why I wanted to stay home, you know, in my earlier part of my career because I had a lot of yeah. family here, and and hard to leave those guys. It's funny. I was born and raised in Clarksville. So, oh yeah, yeah man, very good. Yeah, right down the road from you. Yep, I spent some time in Clarksville. Oh yeah, I'm sure you're probably on the lake down there. Yeah, my uh, my wife's grandfather used to teach ski lessons down in Clarksville. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool, man. Pretty cool. 
Indeed. Well, this thank you for sharing about your family, man. I, I, we we love to hear that. And then we we started playing a game, Jim, and, and we call it the lightning round. It's just a bunch of random stuff. And if you're willing, uh, maybe I'll fire away a few questions. I'll try. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll, we'll have fun with it. Have, we'll st always start easy, man. Favorite food. Favorite food. Hmm. Well, I like all food, but I'd say spaghetti is probably my number okay. one. Okay. Yeah. Hadn't had a spaghetti answer yet, so you take the first one for that. How about uh, <laughs> favorite adult beverage? <laughs> well, I'm a bourbon guy, so I, I, I keep Woodford Reserve close by. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm, I'm headed to Lynchburg when we finish recording. So, uh, well, I'll, I'll be up that way. We'll you let me know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How about, uh, sports teams, man? What, what, what sports teams do you follow? Well, you know, I, I'm absolutely partial to the Hokies. I've never been a big, a big pro ball, um, follower, but I college football, I think would be my number one in, in the Hokies. I mean, you know, there you go. You gotta go with, gotta go with the Hokies. Well, I'll throw this out. You go check out our episode with Travis Hodge, doc, or Dr. Travis Hodge. He was, he played for the Hokies and uh, he was the kicker when they won the sugar bowl. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, uh, one of our, one of our most recent hero conversations. So check that out. I will. Uh, so, all right. How about all time favorite movie? All time favorite movie. Yeah. Oh, wow. You know, I don't watch much TV. I'm a movie guy. I think I'm going to have to go with the Pirates of the Caribbean. I think that was one of my all time favorites. Okay. Yeah. How about music? What, what music do you enjoy? I listen to everything. I like Gershwin and I like Van Halen. I'd say they're, you know, probably a long ways away on the spectrum, but. Nice. I'd say Van Halen was my number one. Van Halen's number one. Okay, there you go. Uh, how about somewhere uh, you hadn't been yet, but you hope to go to one day? Iceland. Iceland. Very nice. Yep. What about your, the place that stands out the most that you had the most time, most fun at, your, your, that you have been to? I love to go to Tennessee. Tennessee. And yep. Can't beat that, man. The Smokies. Can't. I love it. You got that right. You got that right. And how about the last question, dogs or cats? <laughs> dogs. There's only one right I've answer. Got, <laughs> I've got 10. <laughs> 10 dogs. I'm not kidding. My oh. wife, Sindo, uh, she, she's big with the rescue group in Campbell yeah. County right here. And, and uh, we have a few foster failures, but yeah. uh, we, we definitely have our own, uh, <laughs> our own kennel of furry friends, but. Yep, dogs. Awesome, man. Good for you. Good for you. Good for her. So that's that's great, man. This has been so much fun getting to know you, Jim. And I'm very thankful. You know, Whitney Snyder, she connected us, and Pat Connors. I know you work with with them too. So just thankful for this opportunity to to talk to you. And we call it Eco Ask Why, Jim. And we we kind of talks about the passion, what drives people. And I, so if somebody wants to come up to you, Jim, want to know what your personal why is. What would that be? It comes back to that that satisfaction from helping somebody. I think that's it. I mean, it just, you know, it's put here to do that. So. Absolutely. And for, for the listeners out there that want to connect with Jim or, or understand more about AIC and how they can help you, we'll make sure those links are in the show notes. And uh, Jim, thank you so much for taking the time with us today. It's been awesome. Uh, really enjoyed getting to know you, sir. Well, I appreciate the time you guys are taking for me too. I, uh, so glad you had me on. Thanks. Absolutely. You have a great day. All right. You too. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.